Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast as always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Before we start this video, I want to issue a warning. If you are a sensitive viewer or someone who gets triggered or feel very bad about watching um, images or video sequences including air crashes, then you should stop watching right now. For the rest of you, we are going to be talking about the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB's animation of the crash that happened to Atlas Air Flight 3591, who um, crashed into the Trinity Bay in Texas on February 23rd, 2019, and killed um, both pilot and a passive crew member. So stay tuned. Wind 31016, everyone right, right on. Okay guys, so the way that I'm gonna do this is that we're gonna watch through this animation. It will also include some surveillance footage of the actual crash. And then I'm going to at regular intervals stop the animation to tell you some important facts that it's good of, for you to know and to understand. Um, and then towards the end, I will read a direct quote from the NTSB about the cause of the crash, together with some thoughts from myself about the role of typewriting instructors and typewriting examiners out there. So uh, let's have a look at it. We will show a short animation depicting the sequence of events. Note that the depictions are not necessarily identical to the airplane displays. In this still frame, you can see a simulated external view of the airplane, the analog airspeed indicator with digits to aid clarity, the main attitude director indicator including an airspeed tape display and artificial horizon. Here is a representation of the flight mode annunciator display, an analog altimeter also with digits added for clarity, control yoke position, thrust levers, speed brake lever position, a profile graph, and select cockpit voice recorder transcript items. Okay, so just to start off here then, um, this is the kind of information and data that uh, the air crash investigators would need to look at in order to understand how an air crash happened in the first place. Uh, worth the note here is that they haven't shown the position of the flaps and that is actually important to understand this um, the, the, the kind of what's happening later on um, but we'll get to that in a second and uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out is the flight mode annunciator that says go around up here basically that's an instrument that the pilots have straight in front of them on the primary flight display to indicate what the autopilot is doing. So it's extremely important to keep that in the scan in order to understand what the aircraft is doing. Now, let's continue. The crew was setting up the approach procedure when the airplane encountered light turbulence. Shortly afterward, the autopilot and auto throttles entered go around mode as the airplane was passing about 6,300 feet. Okay. So at this point, the aircraft um, is being set up and prepared for the approach, okay? Uh, the first officer is the pilot flying and the captain is pilot monitoring. And the captain is involved in the discussion with our traffic control about radar headings. What They're trying to avoid some, um, some heavy precipitation en route and he is trying to confirm if they want him on a radar heading, on a direct routing. So there's a little bit of distraction on, on behalf of the captain when this all happens and it goes quite quickly. There were no flight crew callouts. Consistent with the activation of the go-around mode, the airplane arrested the descent and began a slight pitch-up, and the thrust levers advanced. Okay, so this is where I was talking about. Um, some of you will be asking, how come the aircraft can go into an automatic go-around when they're at 6,200 feet? And that's actually a very good question, because the, the way that the autopilot system is set up is that even if you push the toga button, which is on the thrust levers, it won't do anything unless the aircraft thinks that it's on an approach, okay? And the only way that the aircraft will feel that it's on an approach is if uh, either you're coupled to a glide slope, for example, or you have selected flaps. And in this case, even though they're very far out and still at a fairly high altitude, for some reason the crew has selected to select flaps one. And that's why when the first officer inadvertently pushes the go-around button, it activates. 
Now, how he pushes the go around button is some, something that we'll never really know. The NTSB thinks that he might have been reaching over for the uh, for the speed brake selector, and when he was doing so, inadvertently kind of pushed the toga button with his arm. I don't really see how that could happen, but we will never really know how that happened. The speed brakes were retracted, which could only be done manually. The captain responded to a routine radio call, while the first officer pushed forward on the column and made an expression about speed and exclaimed, we're stalling. So here, when the aircraft went into that initial pitch, um, they had a little bit of turbulence before, it went to a little bit of a pitch up because it was in go-around mode. Um, and now, for some inexplicable reason, the first officer thinks that that was indicative of stall. All right? They still have all of the instrumentation available to them, including the airspeed. And as you can see, the airspeed is now already overspeeding. Okay? Um, the reason that it overspeeds already at 260 knots is because they have flaps extended, like I was mentioning before. Um, but there's nothing here in indicative of a stall. Okay? Um, there is, however, something called a somatographic illusion that we'll get to in a second. But right now, the aircraft is in a very, very dangerous position. They have a pitch down of 27 degrees or so. Um, they're only at oh, just below 6,000 feet, and they would have an extremely high vertical speed at this point. The, the captain at this point should definitely understand that something is going on and take over the control because it's always the responsibility of the captain to make sure that the aircraft is safe at any given moment. And if he or she doesn't understand what's going on, it's better to take over the control, sort things out, and then try to figure out what was happening. There was no indication that the airplane actually stalled. It was likely that the first officer was experiencing disorientation due to the somatographic illusion in which airplane acceleration results in a false nose-high feeling. Somatographic illusion um, is something that generally happens to people with very low uh, experience of instrument flying when they're flying and they get themselves into cloud, into an IMC condition. And basically what it is, is that the human balance system, which is situated in the inner ear, are not really built to be in a situation like that. We're built to be running around on the savanna, maybe jumping from a tree or two, but we're not built to be sitting in a flying machine, either pitching up or accelerating. So that means that an acceleration actually feels the same for our inner ear as a pitch up. So if you are in a situation with very low visual cues and the, the you know you can't see what's going on, then a slight pitch up together with, a, with, with an acceleration will feel like a huge pitch up, okay? And this has actually caused accidents before when if the pilots are not looking at their instrumentation, they only act on what they feel, they will suddenly just pitch forward very, very rapidly in order to get rid of that feeling of pitching up which can put the aircraft in a very dangerous situation. The somatographic illusion is actually what we are using in the simulator to simulate acceleration and deceleration. Um, you've probably seen a simulator that's just standing on its head like this. Inside of the simulator, when we're watching the screens, the only thing we feel is a very, very quick deceleration, as in when we're braking, when we're doing a rejected takeoff, for example. And outside, what the, the, the simulator is doing is it's pitching heavily forward. So it's using the somatographic illusion to fool the pilots inside that other things are happening to the aircraft. That can happen in the real aircraft as well, and it's extremely, extremely dangerous. The airplane reached a steep nose-down attitude and high speed. Below about 3,000 feet, the airplane broke out of the clouds, the controls moved to full nose up, but it was too late before they impacted the bay. And that last footage was what I was warning people about. Okay, so what I'm about to read now is an exact quote from the NTSB. The NTSB determines that the probable cause of this accident was the inappropriate response by the first officer as the pilot flying to an inadvertent activation of the go-round mode, which led to his spatial disorientation and nose-down control inputs that placed the airplane in a steep descent from which the crew did not recover. Contributing to the accident was the captain's failure to adequately monitor the airplane's flight path and assume positive control of the airplane to effectively intervene. Also contributing were systematic deficiencies in the aviation industry's selection and performance measurement practices, which failed to address the first officer's aptitude-related deficiencies and maladaptive stress response. 
Also contributing to the accident was the Federal, Admin, uh, Federal Aviation Administration's failure to implement the pilot records database in a sufficiently robust and timely manner." Unquote. So what does this mean then? Well, it's actually fairly unusual to see this kind of strong language from the NTSB towards the Federal Ad um, Aviation Administration. And what you're talking about is the fact that the first officer, who clearly was the one that caused this accident, they were flying a perfectly working aircraft straight into this uh, Trinity Bay. This was not the first time that this first officer had reacted in a strange way under pressure. In fact, this first officer had been in a total of six different airlines. In some of those airlines, he had busted both um, line checks and uh, simulator check rides. And the, if you look through the training records, which I have done, which are available and I will link to them down here, um, you will see that many different instructors and many different examiners have written very similar things, namely very poor situational awareness. The, uh, the, the student is very well prepared, but when put into situations which he has not prepared for, acts erratically, pushes buttons without thinking about what those buttons will do, and generally does not take pressure well. Okay, so this means that throughout his career, this pilot has shown signs of not having the aptitude needed in order to be a safe airline pilot. And what the NTSB is saying is that if the FAA would have implemented something they had already planned, which was this, this database of pilots, which the airlines would be able to access and see if a pilot have had these kind of problems before they're being employed, well, in that case, this pilot was likely not going to be employed and this wouldn't have happened. So it's very strong language on behalf of the NTSB towards the FAA in this, um, in this scenario. And something that I really want to, to push her here, which, because I am a type rating instructor and a type rating examiner, is that when I read these, these uh, training transcripts, the hair stands up on my arm, as in it is so scary reading. Because you realize how important the role of a type rating, both instructor and examiner, actually is. It's a very, very bad feeling to fail someone, all right? To, to, to end up at the end of a simulator session having to, to tell the student that they have failed, that they can't continue to work, that they have to do retraining, is a really bad day at the office. However, this is exactly why we have examiners. This is why that fail is so important. I have never ever regretted a fail in my life because what you really don't want is for someone like this to kind of sneak through the net because someone wants to be nice to them or something like that and then they end up in an aircraft doing something like this. The role of the instructor is to, to put down very accurate observations of the kind of training performance of the students and if they see deficiencies or aptitude deficiencies or whatever it might be make sure that it's written down because it will be dug up in case of an investigation that's very clear here and if you're an examiner out there and you're doubting that the pilot in front of you is going to be safe online then just picture yourself putting your own family in this aircraft and have that pilot in the front that's what i always do and say it's this pilot's safe enough to carry your family to their destination. If the answer to that is not really sure, then you put a fail down, you motivate it clearly, you show exactly what needs to improve, and then this pilot can go for more training um, to try to improve, to be stronger in those areas, and if that cannot be achieved, well then their career as an airline pilot is over. That's very sad, but it's less sad than this. That's all I had, guys. Um, if you have questions about this, as always, put them in in the description of the video. Um, I'll see if I can answer them there. Otherwise, you can come in and talk to me and other airline pilots in the Mentor Aviation app, which is absolutely free to download. You have links to it that are downloaded here. There's loads of pilots that you can discuss these kind of things with, technical forums, um, things like this. So take care of yourself and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.